you have your Bible, turn with me. We're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, this evening. And we're going to be finishing up this chapter, which I am very excited about. And what we're going to do uh, this evening is what we've done the last couple of weeks. And that is we are going to read our text. And after we read our text, we're going to pray and ask God to bless his word. So again, Revelation chapter 19, uh, we're looking at verses 11 all the way down to verse 21. And last week, we only covered a few verses. We didn't make it that far. I was hoping that maybe we could do the whole chapter, but I don't think so. But we're going to finish it today. So Revelation chapter 19 there, starting in verse 11, if you would. Let's read the text and then pray. Verse 11. It says, Then I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name that was written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, they followed him on white horses. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them. And the flesh of all people, free, slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the king of the earth, and their armies. They gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest, they were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Pretty gnarly passage of scripture, right? Pretty heavy duty. Let's, let's pray as we ask God to, to meet us here. Lord, we are at this junction in time. We are at this, this massive moment that we have all been waiting for, and that is the return of the King, the return of Jesus Christ at this very moment. It is here that Bible prophecy is fulfilled. It is here that you've come back to redeem us back to yourself. And so, God, may this passage come alive to us. May it do something for us. May it change the way we think the way that we live, that you would stir up in us, Lord, this, this urgency to, to live on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God, just bless your word. God, bring clarity to us this evening in this passage. This, the book of Revelation is very challenging and very hard, yet the Holy Spirit teaches us and leads us into truth. And so open up the word of God to us, our ears uh, that we might hear, our hearts that we might receive. Blessed in Jesus' name. And the church says what? Amen. I love hearing a group say amen. So it's great. We're here. This is part two of this message that we entitled The Return of the King. And why have we entitled that? Well, guys, as you've just read, as we've just read, this is exactly what the theme of Revelation chapter 19 is all about. It is the return of Jesus Christ. This is what we have been, have been anticipating, have been hoping for, praying for the, the past 2,000 years, is that Jesus would finally come back. And guys, if it's not something you think about, if it's not something you pray about, if it's not something on your mind, then 
that needs to change. It ought to be our hearts to long for Jesus to come back. Do I get an amen? All right, give me a little excited. Do I get an amen? I, yeah, I hope so, guys. We should be excited about this. You know, Paul talked about this. In the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, we're going to put this verse up on the screen. Look what it says here, guys. It says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Why? Verse 13, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Guys, this ought to be what motivates us. It should change us. It should cause us to, again, to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly lust, to live soberly. Why? Because we're looking for this great, glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. This is our blessed hope, confident expectation that Jesus is coming back for us. Hey, if you have your Bible handy, turn with me. I want to show you another passage of Scripture. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Here we have another end time eschatological verse here talking about Jesus coming back, the end of all things and what it should do for us. But here in 2 Peter Chapter 3, starting in verse 8, we're going to read a number of verses. I want you to to listen to this. I want you to hear this. Okay, mark this in your Bible. This is vital. Look what it says, how we ought to be living. Starting in verse 8. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand uh, years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth that works um, that are in it will be burned up. Now listen to this, verse 11. Therefore... Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be? In other words, in all these things, how should you be living? What's he say here, there in verse 11? Again, what manner of person ought you to be? But in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and the coming of the great day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, we look to for the new heaven, the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, blameless. Guys, again, the question that we just asked a moment ago that Peter asked is, in light of these things we find in God's word, what should that do to you? What should that change in you? How should your mind, your heart, your life be affected by our theology of Jesus coming back? You know what? It should have an effect on the way you live. It should act, it should change the way that you think. It ought to affect your behavior, your attitude, your thinking, your feeling. It changes everything, guys. This is our blessed hope. It should motivate us. It should cause the church to live on mission with the gospel. You see, this is what we need to realize. Doctrine saves us, but our theology should change us. Our doctrine saves us, but our theology ought to change us, to change the way we live. You know, it doesn't matter what theological system you might have. You know, many churches differ on theology. You know, that's why there's so many different denominations that exist is is the key doctrines. Most, we all agree on those key essential doctrines, but it's where these theological differences that we have, we have different positions that we might have. You know, even with the study of the book of Revelation, we talked about this. There's a number of different positions that people have when it comes to their eschatology, which is the study of the end times. 
And guys, listen, I'm okay with other believers having different eschatological views, but I'll tell, I'll tell you this, it doesn't matter what view you have. If it doesn't change the way you live in your life for the sake of the gospel, then your theology is of no value. It ought to change you. It ought to stir you up. Again, for us, we believe that the church will be raptured prior to this time of eschaton, by this time of tribulation. Now, again, I want to talk about this just by way of refresher because I think that we need to realize that there's two distinct moments um, in time when it comes to the return of Jesus, okay? The first is out of the rapture of the church. I just mentioned it here a moment ago, the rapture of the church. And what the rapture of the church is, is simply this. It is Jesus coming for his church. It's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This event will be for all believers, for the church. Again, for us, this will happen in a moment in time, a twinkling of an eye. It says in 1 Corinthians 15. And we believe that this event will take place prior to the time called the tribulation. But the second event when it comes to Jesus in this eschatology is the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ. This is what we read here in Revelation chapter 19. This is when Christ comes back to fight and battle and defeat Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet to destroy evil, to establish his millennial reign. That's what we're looking at here, Revelation chapter 19, the second coming of of Christ. And there's two distinct differences between them. And it's important we understand this. Again, the rapture of the church is of Christ snatching us up. That in 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about uh, us being, the Greek word is harpazo, to be caught up with the Lord. Again, the second coming is Jesus coming back with his church, with his saints. Again, we touched this a little bit last week. We'll touch it tonight. The rapture occurs before the tribulation, 1 Thessalonians 5, Revelation chapter 3. But the second coming comes after the great and terrible tribulation in, from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19. The rapture is removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5. But the second coming includes the removal of unbelievers as an act of judgment on earth. Again, the rapture is imminent. There's this doctrine called the doctrine of imminence that at any moment in time, Christ can come back for his church. Again, Titus 2.13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. But the second coming of Christ will not occur until after certain end time events. And Bible prophecy is fulfilled. 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, Revelation 6 through 18. Many passages of scripture speaks of that. But here, where we're at this weekend, where we're at tonight, is Revelation chapter 19, dealing, focusing on the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Christ. Now, with that, with that segue, let's jump back into our text. Do you remember where we left off? Do you remember what we talked about last week? Because we want to do a little bit of review. We read there in verse 11 that John sees heaven open up. Like never before, it's open up, it's swung wide open. And John sees out of heaven this horse that is coming out of heaven. And there is one riding on the horse. And who's the one riding on the horse? It is Jesus himself coming on his faithful, trusted horse. And the one that came riding on it, who was he? It was Jesus. But how is he described? He's described in verse 11 as the one that is faithful and the one that is true. Faithful and true. Because that's Jesus. He is faithful and true. And again, that's who he is. Why is he called faithful and true? Because Jesus is going to do all that he said he would. He will fulfill every promise. He will keep every word. He has ever given us his church. And we know that he will come this time as a judge and he will judge in righteousness and he will judge in truth and he comes to make war. He doesn't come in peace. He comes to make war. Much different 
The first coming of Jesus is much different than the second coming of Jesus. Now, we talked about this last week, and I want to repeat this. The first coming of Jesus, he came as a baby. The second coming of Jesus, he comes as a king. The first coming of Jesus, he came in humility. But the second coming of Christ, he comes in glory. The first coming of Jesus, he came to die for sin. But the second coming of Jesus, he comes to judge sin. The first coming, Jesus came to make and bring peace. But the second coming of Jesus, he comes to make war. And this will be done publicly. This will be done globally. This will be done for all to see and to witness. Again, Matthew 24, 27. We used this verse last week. We'll put it up on the screen. Matthew 24, 27. It says, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, everyone will see it, everyone will know it, not one eye, not one mind, not one life. Everyone in the globe will understand what is happening because Jesus will come and this will be for the world to see. And again, Jesus coming back is going to be much different than what we've ever seen before. How will that be? What will Jesus be like? Well, we read there in verse 12 that he will have eyes that are flames of fire. Much different. There is a sword coming out of his mouth. His robe is dipped in blood. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back to make war. This is all like war language, war imagery. He's coming back. It's gnarly. It's scary. It's, it's crazy. He's coming back, though. Again, fire always speaks of judgment, of, 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 of precedent, of Jesus bringing, again, nothing hidden from his eyes. We read that he has all these crowns on his, on his head, speaks of rulership and authority. Again, he's coming back with judgment. There's his name that no one knows except himself. Here's what I love, though. Is at the, at the end of verse 13 where we left off last week, look what it says. It says that he was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. I love that. He is the word of God. It's so important that we understand this. Again, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was what? God. And the word became flesh. Speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. What's that mean? It means this, that Jesus is the final and full revelation of all that God wants to reveal to us. It's found in Jesus. The more of Jesus that you know, the more of God we will grasp. That's the key. Now we pick up here in verse 14. This is where we left off last week. So jump with me. Look at verse 14. It says this. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, they followed him on white horses. Jesus is coming back, but he's not coming back alone. Jesus is coming on a horse, but he's not coming on a horse alone. It says that there's an army that is following Jesus back here on earth. I don't know about you, but that like, I love, I love that. I, I love the fact that there's this army right behind Jesus. Jesus. Here is the world being destroyed by Satan, Antichrist, false prophet. Just when you think there's no hope, just when you think there's no dawn, just when you think it's just covered in darkness, and all of a sudden heaven is opened up. And first, by himself, Jesus on this horse, cards coming out. Air horse one. I said that last week, I'm going to say it again. Air horse one, he comes out. And then after you see Jesus, you go, whoa, no way. All of a sudden behind him. All the, you can hear these, these hoof, print, hoof prints, you know, when they're on, on the ground. And, and there's like this thunderous noise. And there's an army behind him. You know, I, I can't help but think of like Lord of the Rings, you know, when they're, they're losing in battle. And you think, there's no hope. We're all going to die. And then up on this hill, there's like this glorious light. And there's, there's I don't know who it was. But there's some hero, and he's coming over the hill, and all of a sudden there's all these horses, and, and the enemy's looking at this going, what are we going to do? That's what's happening right here, except it's not make-believe, it's Jesus. And the armies of heaven are showing up. Who is this army? What is this army? They're clothed in fine linen. They're white. They're clean. Who are these people? Anybody know? It's us. It's 
you. It's me. We're riding with Jesus here in victory on horses. Anybody like horseback riding? Anybody? Just a few. One, two, three, four, five, maybe five. You, yes. Yeah, I, I remember growing up, my dad, my dad used to do a bunch of things. My dad loved horseback riding. And for years, we used to go every weekend, we'd go, we'd go to these one area, the stables, and we would go, and my dad, man, he was packed, he would do bareback, he would, he would have his own saddle, he was like this city slicker cowboy guy, but he, and we would go with him as kids, and so for years, I used to ride horses, I'd ride bareback, I'd ride ponies, I'd ride horses, and, and there's all the, they had different levels, they had the really old horses that barely move, and that's like what you start with, it's like, come on, and you kick them, they're like, I'm moving. And this is really slow. But over time, then finally you get to that one horse. When you look at it, it just looks at you, right? And you kind of move to the development. You know, I, I had some practice. Guys, you better get some practice because we are coming back with Jesus on these horses. And we are clothed in fine linen. Guys, it is the saints. It is the church. It is the servants of God. We're coming back with him. Again, How do we know that this is us? Well, if you go back there in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 8, this is the church. It's us that are clothed in righteousness. That's who we are. Again, this isn't the first time we've seen this in heaven. Remember after the rapture of the church, Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5, John gets this glimpse of heaven, and there's these saints singing the songs. That, that we, are, we are unworthy because it was the blood of Jesus that redeemed us back to himself. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. This is the saints. This is the church, the body of Christ. And we're coming back with Jesus. You know, one of the questions I always get as pastors, as a pastor, I always get this question from kids. Pastor Louie, are there any animals in heaven, right? They were like their dog or fish dies, or their dog dies. And Pastor Louie, is my, is my puppy in heaven? You know, I, I can't answer that definitely. But here's the thing I can say. We know that there are animals in heaven because there's horses coming out of heaven. So if there's horses, I think there'd be something else. I'm praying for my dog, my honey. I have a golden doodle. And we love her, and we're praying for her salvation. She's still not there yet. She still jumps and leaves the house sometimes disobediently. But boy, I think for most of us that love our pets, we'd say, man, it'd be great. Heaven would be just a little bit better if we had our pets with us, right? You know what I'm saying? We don't know. Here's what we do know, though. Jesus comes back on this horse. Here's what we need to grasp. This is going to be a great and powerful and wonderful day. Because Christ is coming with his saints. And here's what we need to realize, guys. This is what we need to grasp. His victory at this moment is your victory. His win, his victory, his triumph here in Revelation 19 is also ours. He is going to overcome Satan. He's going to overcome the world. He's going to overcome sin. And we are sided with Jesus. And his victory becomes ours. Why? Because we are those that are clothed in white. We are those that are coming back clean. We are those that are the redeemed. We are the righteous in Christ. Man, I don't, I, man it's always good when you have backup, you know? Uh, I remember as a kid, I grew up in LA and there'd be these street fights you kind of get into and, and it's always great when someone's about to beat you up and then that group comes behind you and says, don't touch the little guy. And you look back and there's all the big people and you're like, yeah, don't touch the little guy. <laughs> and, and you're there because you got the backup. Well, Jesus doesn't need the backup, but we get to be his backup. We come with him in victory and in glory. Us, the undeserved. Us, the ones saved by grace. Guys, you don't have a sword in your hand. There's no swords coming out of your mouths. All you got is a horse and your clothes. That's it, your white linens. That's all you have. And Jesus is the one coming back and Jesus is the one with the sword. He's the one with the weapon. He's the one that really gets the glory and the victory. But we get the victory through Jesus. Our identity is in him for what he does and what he's doing for us. Verse 14, 
And it says, and the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, they followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Again, we saw, we saw this sword coming out of his mouth back in Revelation chapter 1, right? When we saw this with John's first introduction to the glorious appearing of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. But here, Jesus is going to use this sword that comes out of his mouth to strike all the nations. Now, here's the question that we always ask, right, as we study this book. It's a very challenging book to study, to interpret. Okay, Pastor Louis, I understand this. Is this literal or is this imagery? Like, is Jesus literally going to be coming back on this horse? And he's going to be like, poof, poof, like shooting swords, like missiles, poof, poof, Antichrist, poof, you know, uh, Russia, poof. You know, is, that, that, is that the way it's going to be? I don't necessarily think so. I believe that a lot of this is just imagery that speaks to truth. We know that the sword coming out of his mouth, what it speaks to, it's a dramatic way of imagery speaking to the power of the word of God, right? We're told this, book of Hebrews, right, that the, the, uh, or, uh, that the, that the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. We know that. Hebrews 4, 12, we'll put it up on the screen. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the, the division of the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We know in Ephesians 6 that the word, that the word of God is a sword of the spirit. And so it's all through the power of the word of God that Jesus is going to come back in victory. This is why, church, it's so important we understand this. Listen, this is important. This is why we must give ourselves to the word of God. Not the word of man. Guys, we don't follow culture. Culture doesn't decide how we live. Culture doesn't dictate what marriage is. Culture doesn't, doesn't dictate God's creation, that he's made them male and female. The word of God dictates to us what God has said and what God is doing. So we ask ourselves this question, are we giving ourselves to the word of God? Are we giving ourselves to the word of truth? Guys, our nation right now is hanging in the balance of all sorts of decisions, of all sorts of different ideologies. Supreme courts are deciding what marriage is. Supreme courts are deciding what gender is. Listen, the Supreme Court doesn't decide that. The Word of God does. Because God is the creator of all men. Again, we're on this cusp today where real and true and biblical Christianity is being called evil. Because where we stand is not on the word of man, but upon the word of God. And if we stand on anything other, then we are standing on sinking sand. You can never go wrong standing upon the word of, Christ, uh, the word of God. Again, truth is not defined as man decides, but by the never-changing, ever-truthful, powerful word of God. Do I get an amen for that? Yes. That is where we stand. That is where we fall. That is where, you know, based on the culture that we are living in right now in the West, that it's only a matter of time before they will literally come in the doors and arrest us for standing against sin and unbiblical ideologies. It's only a matter of time. If you don't see that in our culture right now, where if you stand against anyone in opposition to their ideologies that they call it hate speech, just wait. The Bible is going to be called hate speech. And if you trust and stand upon the Bible, then you're going to be guilty. Prepare yourself now, church, to stand upon 
the never-changing, always truthful, powerful word of God. And this is why for us here at Denver Calvary, we place such a great and important emphasis on the word of God. This is why that we teach the way we teach. This is why we go book by book and verse by verse. This is why we do ministry the way that we do it. It's because of the word of God. Again, Jesus, he's coming out of heaven. He's on a white horse, flame, eyes with flames of fire and all his glory, a robe dipped in blood, sword coming out of his mouth. Behind him comes his saints, you and I, his church. We get one more description in verse 16. It says, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. What's it say? King of kings and Lord of lords. Anybody here like boxing? Anybody? I know I, I, I used to love to watch boxing. This is like kind of pre-MMA, right? I used to love watching boxing. I would watch it on Saturday afternoons. I'd watch it on Sunday afternoon, Saturday night, Sunday night boxing. They, they used to have all these like key focuses on boxing. And when the boxers would come out, they would have their theme music. But what would they have over themselves? A robe, right? And they would come out and they would have it on the back of their robe. They would have their name, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard. I used to love watching Sugar Ray, right? Or Tyson or all those guys. They would come out and they would even have some models either on their belt or on their sides. And here is Jesus coming like a boxer with his robe. And it says here that he has this name that's written. That's written on his robe and it's written on his thigh. What is it? King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, do you notice that verse right there, verse 16, King of Kings and Lord, do you notice it's any different than the, the verse prior or the verse after? What's different about it? It's all in caps. Listen, when something is all in caps, you got to go, why is it all in caps? You have to ask that question. Listen, this is the only place in the entirety of the Bible where we find this title of Jesus all in caps. Every text, listen to this, every text, every manuscript, every ancient document that comprises the entirety of Bibles that have ever in all existed have this passage all in caps. Why? Because it's making a very important, powerful statement. You know, when we send an email to someone or you send a text. There's times that we use caps, right? You know what I'm saying? And usually we use caps for a reason. It's usually when we're trying to emphasize something. This is important, all in caps. You think and you read that, you go, huh, I guess this is important, right? Because it's all in caps. But it's really creepy when you get one of those emails and the whole thing is in caps. I, I, I can't read that. That's like weird. You see that, you're going like, what was wrong with this? Why are they yelling at me? And so guys, let me just say something. If you ever send me an email and it's all in caps, do you know what I do with them? Delete. <laughs> I won't read it. I just won't read it. So if you send me a text all in caps, I'm not going to read it. Uh, it's just creepy. It's just weird. You, just, you don't do that, okay? You don't, it can sound like you're shouting at someone. The emphasis here can't be any clearer. Jesus is king of all other kings. Jesus is Lord over all other and any lords. It's making a very profound statement. Right now in our world, there are many kings and lords. You have rulers in, in countries. You have dictators, prime ministers. You have those that are multi-billionaires. The Amazon guy, the Facebook guy. Listen, these guys are kings and lords over many. They have their own empires. They have all the wealth and money you can possibly imagine. Corporations that rule others. But when Jesus comes back, none of that's gonna matter. Because he doesn't have one crown. He has every single crown that any leader in this world that has ever owned or had. He is coming back because he rules them all. And again, what 
this second coming of Christ ultimately proves and shows and displays is the glory of Christ. There's a verse in Jeremiah, we'll put it up on the screen, Jeremiah 10, 10, look what it says. But the Lord is the true God. Notice, it capitalized, the Lord, emphasizing Jehovah, Yahweh. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. He is the everlasting king, and at his wrath, the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. He's the true king. He's the true Lord of it all. Verse 17, look with me, down to verse 21. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Interesting. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, we know who that is, the king of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus, who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jesus is coming back to redeem. Jesus is coming back to judge. He is coming back to face Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all those who have opposed him. And we know that there's going to be a battle, and that's what's described in these verses here. Verses 17 through 21, there's this battle. And this battle is known as the battle of what, church? Armageddon. That's right, the battle, I know it's hard to talk in your mask, but thank you so much, you know, being gracious and wearing them. Still coming and wearing them, it's gracious, so good. This battle of Armageddon. And we read that this angel that's standing in the sun talks about these birds coming and feasting on the flesh of those on the earth. That they're going to be wiped out and then they feast on their flesh. In ancient culture, when people went to battle, to war, One of the worst fears that the warrior would have is not only just to be killed, but rather to be left on the battlefield. Because as they are left to die and their bodies rot, the birds of prey and the vultures begin to circle. And what they eventually do is they come down and they begin to feast on their body. The dogs, the wild dogs would then come and feast off their body flesh. And to those warriors, listen, it was the ultimate dishonor to have that happen to you, for your body to be abused in such a way when someone is killed in battle, you're supposed to honor them. And the way that you honor them is you take their body and you take it home and you bury them and you celebrate their life. But to be left on the battlefield was the ultimate display of defeat, the ultimate show of shame to be left there to rot, and for the animals to eat away at your flesh. And so what we just read, verses 17 through 21, this is, again, imagery. It could be literal, but I think what's being described is, is how these things will unfold, that they will be left in the battlefield. Their sin and their rebellion, the rejection of Jesus is dealt with, and they're left with total shame for rejecting Jesus Christ, for rejecting the two witnesses, for rejecting the church, for rejecting the nation of Israel, that they're left in shame. Again, we talked about this a little bit. You guys remember us talking about the battle of Armageddon? Uh, Hold your spot there, Revelation 19. Turn to your left to Revelation 16. Just a couple of pages, a page or two, Revelation chapter 16, starting in verse 12. It says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl 
on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. So that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And then I saw three unclean spirits. This gets a little freaky. Listen to this. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, of which the whole world, listen, the whole world will gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. And behold, I am coming. This is Jesus speaking. I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather together, them together, to a place in Hebrew, Hebrew called, what's your Bible say? Armageddon. Armageddon. So there's going to be this battle that takes place in the end before as Christ comes back. Now the question is, where is this going to happen? Where is this battle possibly going to take place? Now, we're not told specifically where this is going to happen. We're not given a specific location, but Jesus, God's word tells us it's going to be the battle of Armageddon. And the name Armageddon comes from two Hebrew words. The Hebrew, uh, Hebrew word har and the Hebrew word Megiddo or Megiddo, the word Har means a hill, and the word Megiddo or Megiddo, it, it means uh, two set significant meanings, the place of troops or the place of slaughter. And so many believe this to be at the place called the Plain of Estrelon, also known as the, va as the Valley of Jezreel. That that's what's going to take place at that location. Now, when we went to Israel, we went to Israel in February, early February, we had a team of 20, right? 20? We had a team of 20. And we actually went to Megiddo, Megiddo. We went to Tel Megiddo. And there on Mount Carmel and there on Mount Megiddo, we can see the Valley of Jezreel. It's huge. It's an area of about 14 miles wide, 20 miles long. And it's known for some of the world's most famous battles. Napoleon called it the most natural battlefield of the whole earth. There are over 200 historic battles that happened there. And listen, when you stand on Mount Carmel, you stand on the hill of the Tel of Megiddo, you see this and you think, yeah, I can see this happening here. This battle of Armageddon, where the nations are there thinking they're going to stand and fight against the Lord. Oh, we got the picture. Thanks, James. Yeah, this is us. I took this picture on Mount Carmel. And as far as the eye can see, that is the, the plains of Jezreel. Do you have the other one too? That right there is us standing on Megiddo. Megiddo. That is about, uh, I want to say, 20 miles northeast of where that last picture was. And there we are standing as far as the eye can see, the battle of Megiddo. And there's a verse in scripture that we read that says that the valley will be filled with blood up to the horse's bridle because the, the, the judgment that's coming, this battle of Armageddon. And so the forces are going to be gathered here. They stand in complete and total opposition to Jesus. We know that this is completely demonic, satanic. That's what we just read in Revelation 16. From the Antichrist to the false prophet, inspired by the dragon, Satan. And they're going to have this battle against the Lord. And listen, church, it isn't far from us today. You put your hand to the pulse of our world. You put the hand to the pulse of our country. You put the hand to the pulse of, of Russia and Iran and China and how they all feel with Israel. Listen, they all hate Israel. They're going to stand against her. It's coming. And here's what we need to realize, though. Back in Revelation 19. Here's what we got to realize. There is a battle called the Battle of Armageddon. But in reality, it's not really much of a battle. Why? Because there's really no fight. Jesus just wins. There's no, there's no battle. Jesus isn't going to be like, oh, man, Louie, can you help me? I'll be like, yeah, Jesus, I got you. It's not going to be like that. 
He's not going to need any help. He's not going to have any struggle. He's not going to have any sweat. He comes and listen. He just wins. He just wins. That's what happens. What do we read here? Revelation 19, uh, verse 19. As Jesus comes back, what's he see? And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. Verse 20, and the beast was captured. Wow, that's pretty easy. <laughs> Jesus comes back and just grabs them. You know, you never see like dogs where they, they grab another animal by, by the back of the neck, like puppies. You just grab them. I got you. That's what Jesus is going to come do. You know, the Antichrist, oh, come here, buddy. Got you. False prophet, don't run away. Got you. He, yeah, that simple. That easy. That's how it's going to unfold. Verse 20, and the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet. And what happens to them? And he says, he, because they deceive those that, that receive the mark of the beast, these two, these two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, it says here, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. What could that possibly be? I think it's very clear that that's hell. He takes them and he throws them into hell. However this will unfold, we're not quite sure. The book of Revelation is, is a mystery. Eschatology is a mystery. God reveals just enough to warn us, prepare us, to stir us, to change us, to strike a healthy fear of God in us, right? How will it practically unfold completely? We're not totally sure. But here's what we do know. Jesus wins. To that I say amen. He wins. Babylon is defeated. The false prophet is defeated. The Antichrist is defeated. Well, what about Satan? Listen, he's going to get dealt with next. Next. When? Next week. Next week. I know cliffhanger, right? It's like, whoa, what's going to happen to the devil? Well, you got to come back next week. We're not going to stream the service. You got to come in person. No, just joking. We'll still stream it. But next week, he deals with Satan. And we get this wonderful victory in the Lord. Church, let me ask you once again, whom are you living for today? Whom are, how are you making decisions today? For who? Just yourself? Are you making them for the Lord? Because remember who we are, church. We are those that are coming back with Jesus, riding with Jesus. We are heaven bound for Jesus. For us, we await the rapture, the imminence of Christ at any moment. I can't wait. I wish it would happen right now. It's coming. This past week, my wife and I attended a funeral. We couldn't be there physically, but we watched online. Of a friend of ours, someone that we've known for... 25, 30 years. Maureen Schaefer, she came and did our women's retreat last year. She'd been battling cancer for 8, 10 years, something like that. And finally cancer won. And so they had this, this incredible funeral. There was four or 500 people that watched online. There was probably another 400, 500 people that were there at the church. And after, with watching this, this service, now we know Maureen and, and the kind of woman that she was, but you couldn't walk away from that funeral without being affected by it. Not because someone died, but because of how someone lived. She had a powerful testimony of someone that lived radically and completely for Jesus. And it was overwhelmingly convicting and overwhelmingly incredible and overwhelmingly just the testimony that she had, not just from her husband, not just from her kids, but from, from, from all the people that knew her. And it makes you wonder and it makes you think and it makes us ask, what's going to be said with our life when we are no longer here? Man, again, 
May we live unto Jesus with a fervency, church, with an excitement. Even as the days grow darker, listen, don't let that ruin you. Let it strengthen you. As the days get darker, it allows you to live brighter for the Lord. But listen, it doesn't mean people are going to like you. In fact, every time you share the gospel and someone mocks you, that's a stripe. That's a, a new ranking in your life in Jesus. If someone makes fun of you and mocks you and persecutes you, Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are the persecuted. Because then we're doing, we know that we're doing what Jesus has asked us to do. Jesus is coming back, King of kings and Lord of lords. May we live for him today. And the church says what? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this word.